The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. All right. We'll dive back in for some more fun. Salt states. Now, I've actually gotten into some arguments with people about my term of calling the configuration management component of salt states. And um, primarily because people say, well, why don't you just call it configuration management? <laughs> and, I, and, and if you've talked to me, oftentimes I do just call it configuration management because people know what that is. And I say, well, we do state management. And they, what? The whole idea behind state management is that you're managing atomic states on the system and that you don't need to build necessarily a large, the large state tree to do it. You can interact with individual atomic states on those systems because we build everything out in layers. And so, like we were talking about before, the base layers of SALT are remote execution bus, system API via the modules. And so the next thing we have is a state API. And then we've got ways in which we can call the state API depending on what level of the stack, so to speak, you want to interact with the system. Generally speaking, you pick a level and you stay there and it just kind of happens. Because you go, oh, well, this makes sense up here for my deployment. But I've worked with a lot of deployments and I know that they're not all going to be the same, so I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm going to give you options, and when, when, you, when I present or when you go through tutorials, they're usually going to peg in certain locations and then mention, by the way, you can do it. There's like these other little levels here, just so you know, for you to explore. But we're going to use what we feel are going to be the general defaults as to how someone's going to interact. But anyway, what we're going to cover in this presentation <coughs> Um, the basic aspects of the state system. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the top file, which is how you map um, certain state files back to certain minions. And you'll see that we use those targets inside the top file, which is why it's important to cover those early. Um, SLS files, which are kind of similar if you're familiar with like Puppet to Manifest or Chef to Recipes. We'll talk a little bit about what those are made out of. We're going to talk about the state module itself. The state module is a module inside of all of these executions. And that's how you execute states because, I mean, that's how you execute anything in SALT, is through our core system API, through the modules. We're going to talk about um, a number of the functions inside of the state module. There's some things in there for debugging. There's some things in there to allow you to run states in different ways. There's things in there that allow you to bypass the top file. There's things in there that allow you to say, I just want to run this one individual state. We're going to then talk about SLS components. Um, if, if you take a nap during that, that's OK. I shouldn't say it like that. I won't be offended. It can be a little dry. We're going to talk very briefly about a piece of technology inside of SALT called pillar. And Yes, it's a pillar of salt. Um, if you're running away from a city that's being annihilated by God, don't look, don't look behind you if you get the reference. Um, it's a biblical reference. I'm going to have to get more religious references because it is salt, and th that's where it shows up prevalently in mythology and religion. Um, <coughs> and I'll have to get some non-Judeo-Christian ones as well, of course. And uh, and then say what? Right. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> that was that was good. I'm impressed. <laughs> okay. And then we're going to briefly talk about how this SLS structure 
which uh, how, how the actual data then maps back into the literal SALT code. Because I show generally when people see that, a light bulb goes on and says, really, that's all that's going on? Because we go through and we talk about these SLS files, we talk about states, and, um, and there's a lot of little components and little pieces that are helpful to know. You don't need to know them, but they're very helpful to know. And you look at how the state files are laid out, and the goal was to make them as intuitive as possible, but on the same hand, make them, uh, make them create a lot of internal mappings and structures. Okay. So that's what you get to listen to me talk about for the next hour. Okay. Salt states. Now, before going forward, and talking about what salt states are, I'm going to see if I can get enough juice out of a web browser. So far, so good. And we'll take a quick look at the salt code. Cool, got a pull rack. All right. Inside of the salt, inside of the salt code, <coughs> we've got these directories: grains, modules, renders, returners, runners, and states. These are all plug-in directories, where we can just drop added functionality to salt. And this is and this is very central to how states works. If we look into modules, we see these are all of those Python modules that we were talking about just a few minutes ago that make up this core API. Um, it's way too small right now. I, I really, if, if you guys want to add to it, that's great. Give me some pull recs. Okay, and we've got all this Windows support in here and et cetera, et cetera. But so if we go back and say, well, how, how do these work? Um, there it is. And we kept running this test dot, this test thing. Fundamentally, these are just flat Python modules. The goal here being that I wanted to make it as ridiculously simple as possible to write, to extend salt with modules. And so they're just Python. You don't have to import anything. Salt does all the work of pulling up one of these files, looking at it, and figuring out how it's going to abstract the functionality inside of it for you so that it's just easy. And we go back and we see that if we run test.ping, we're just running test module, like I was saying, ping function, and it returns true. And there's your documentation. And so states over here, what they do is you've got a module, a state module, that wraps the functionality of stateful behavior on top of the functionality of just getting crap done in the modules. And so that's fundamentally what states are, is a thin veneer with, with a system to execute them in, in a deterministic order and these sorts of things so that you can group them together, but fundamentally a thin veneer on top of the modules that facilitate stateful behavior. Okay? And so for instance, we can look at this package state, one thing and which is great, if we go back into the modules, we'll see a Pac-Man module, a yum package module, an abscap module, and an e build or yeah, it's called e-build um, for the portage module. And um, <coughs> Um, but since it genericizes things, then the states can be, it's just the PKG state. But again, it's just a function. And we're going to come back to this and to the, to the reason why and, and how some of this works. Okay. When we're defining states, okay, they're just plain data. Um, I didn't want to make a, a domain-specific language. I didn't want to write a programming language for two reasons. 
Um, and I think both of these reasons are very good reasons. The first is that I'm terribly lazy. And the second is because I really don't like having a beard. And anybody can tell you that if you're not going to grow a beard, then your programming language is going to take off. OK. More importantly, the reason why they're data structures is because they're extremely pluggable. You can take a data structure from any programming language, shove it through something like JSON, and then hand it to Salt, and it can work with it. And so, again, it makes Salt ridiculously extensible. But since they're just data, and they're just data structures, then we can interact with these data structures pretty much any way that we want. Now, by default, we do it, we do it with, the YAML, with YAML files, and we arrange them in a tree. Um, but we'll, we'll take a very brief inroad throughout the day as to some of the other ways in which we can interact with these states. Now, the tree is made to be as flat and straightforward as possible. Again, we're trying to make it as simple as possible. Um, I'm an arch guy, and it's all about keeping it simple. Simple, straightforward, easy to grok. Now, um, you, you can also make it environment-centric, and we'll talk very briefly on how to do that. Okay. Now we're going to start making a state tree. So I'm going to hop over to a terminal now. Actually, I'm going to start in, I'm going to start by doing this. <laughs> And then I'm going to talk for another couple of minutes, because I want them. <laughs> OK. When we set up a state tree, uh, the first thing that we need to do is we're going to take a look at the salt master configuration file. There's a single configuration inside of the master config file that defines how the state tree, or where the state tree is, and how the state tree is going to behave. Since states are environment-based, we can define multiple environments to look up. By default, there's a base environment, and you have to have your base environment. It's kind of the foundation. Inside of that configuration, we can overlay directories as well. So we can prioritize directories. This is particularly uh, a nice, and, and this, was, this, uh, this feature was requested, and then I realized that I'd built it in inadvertently. Um, but this is particularly nice because you can have one directory with a state tree that you might get stock from the guy writing the state tree, or it might be stock for another environment, and then have another directory that has just modifications, and it'll find those in an, in an ordered manner so that you can overlay state trees very, very cleanly. Um, the directory structure is what defines how we name the SLS components, and the, or rather, sorry, the SLS files. And, um, and everything is made to be very Unix-like in that everything's just a file. There's no magic paths. When you refer to something, you're referring to it as the location of a file, generally. Who said that? Thank you. Um, what does SLS stand for? Um, I, picked the, I picked the term SLS um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, because it was a file extension that wasn't heavily used already. Um, but primarily what it stands for is SALT states. S SALT states. So it is a very lousy. <laughs> Acronym. I'm not going to pretend that it isn't. I need Ruby libs for Vim. Yeah. I guess you're right. Well, yeah, yeah, and we're in Fedora, so it's it's. I, I always find it fascinating to look at different distributions. 
um, policies on including dependencies. And um, yeah, we look at right, right in Gen two. You've got your, you've got. Um, God, it's been twenty years since I've been a Gen two guy. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, in Gen two, you've got uh, you've got your make include your yeah your make additions and things like that, so that you're compiling in extra components, and that's that's a really cool way to do it. Um, and then you've got systems like Arch that say, well, uh, we're just not going to install all the dependencies because we want it lean, <laughs> and that can be rather aggravating sometimes. <laughs> And then we've got guys like Fedora that say, let's, let's add pretty much all the dependencies. And then we've got guys like um, Debian Ubuntu that say, let's add even more. Actually, they, because they compartmentalize it. And they come back and they say, well, these are required. These are recommended. And actually, I, I like that, that, that about Debian, because, they com because they're able to cleanly compartmentalize those. All right. There we go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Firing patience is a known limitation of yum. Oh. All right. Now, <laughs> if we go down the master configuration file, um, we want to we want to go down in and focus on states. I'm I'm using too much time, but that's all right. Did I open the master? Oh, right. Okay. So hopefully uh, this config file doesn't turn into what the squid config file used to look like, for any of you who are familiar with that. One of the world's most well-commented config files. It had something like 6,000 lines of comments in it. Um, but the, these config files are very well commented. And uh, sometime today I'll go over, the, go over the documentation structure in a little more detail so that you can see how every, every one of the options inside of uh, the config files are also thoroughly documented online. Anyway, when we're setting up the state system, well, what, we, uh, what we deal with is called this file roots directive. By default, it looks like this. We've got file roots, we've got a base environment, and it's got one directory in it, serve salt. <coughs> now, if we want multiple environments, then we can define them up here and define what directories those environments are in. And then they take priority based on what order they are in this list. So if we look up an SLS file and there's the same SLS file as in this directory and this directory, it's going to use the one at the top of the list. Okay? And same with any file that we query from um, the state system, which just runs off of the salt file server. So the default setup is to just have a base environment and serve salt. That's what we're going to focus on here. OK. Now, I'm going to start building out this state tree by making a top file. Now, what the top file does is we declare environment again. It's, it's all YAML. Or rather, it's a data structure that by default is represented in YAML. And then we give it a matcher, or rather a target. And then we list SLS modules. So that's a functional top file in that everybody who checks into this guy is going to look for a mo um, an SLS module called Apache and install it. So now let's make that module. 
make that an SLS module. I'm working on figuring out a way to make the word module a little less overloaded in salt. So, yes. Okay, so now we're in this directory and we've got, there are two possible locations that we can put this Apache SLS module. One is that just right flat here in the root we can say Apache.SLS which is all fine and dandy if you're not doing, if you've got a pretty small state tree. But generally we like to organize things in a little more hierarchical fashion. And so the other way that we can define it is this way. I make an Apache directory and then make an SLS file called init. So if it's apache.sls, then that will be the Apache SLS module. Or if it's in a directory and called init, then that will be the Apache SLS module. Similarly, let's say that we wanted to do um, Apache custom.sls. We would call this in the top file by saying apache.custom. And, we'll and we'll make some of these as we move, move on. All right, so I've got now an SLS file. What we're going to do to make this SLS file is start going over what this data structure looks like. And the most basic way to do this is we make what we call an ID, ID declaration. I see this is Fedora, so And so we've got the ID up there, which is HTTPD, the name of the package that we want to have installed, and we're done. Is Apache called HTTPD on Fedora? My, my brain's going blank. Thank, thank you. <laughs> well, give, give me a second. <laughs> All right. All right, maybe we're not done. <laughs> That's right, SLS, isn't it? Oh, no, it's not. <sighs> right. Gall. Just, just, I'm, I'm wretched. <laughs> now, obviously, I just told it to install Apache because I'm an idiot. <laughs> you know, I've got this great fiber line into my house. <laughs> and I'm just, yeah. Okay. I'm not going to wait. All right. Now, this is the most basic way to declare a stanza inside of an SLS file. But let's say that we want this to be a little more robust. We want to start Apache as well. We want to lay down a config file. So let's start, let's start looking at what that entails. Uh, looks like that. So now we're going to start Apache as well. Control-C out of yum at the wrong time, and I've got a corrupted Apache install now. What, what do you bet?
Okay. So what it's going to do now is it goes through that SLS file, it reads in, um, it reads in the data, compares, and then compiles that data down into an ordered list of things to execute. In this case, it's going to get us a list of two. One is going to be the pkg.installed function for Nginx. The other is going to be the service.running function for Nginx. It's going to execute those in a, in a particular order. Yep, I've messed up the YUM repository. Man, that didn't take me real long now, did it? It's going to execute those in a, in a particular order. And then when it's done, it's going to dump out a piece of uh, data to us. Ha ha! That says that it failed. Fantastic. We get more colors that way. Now, all right, we've got some logging as to what goes on, but now this is, this is really the important stuff. If it's coming up in blue, then it means that the result is true and changes happened. If it comes up in red, then the result is false. If it comes up in green, then the result is true and no changes happened. Now, we've got a, hopefully a pretty clear view of what happened, and it shows it in order of what, of what occurred, that we ran state package. The name of the state was Nginx. The function was installed. It worked. We've got a little comment. We installed package Nginx. And then we've got all of the changes that occurred with respect to this particular state. And this, this list right here, if we were to install something with a lot of dependencies, would list every package that was installed along with Nginx when we executed that yum command so that we get a very full dump of what happened. Uh, I have a question. So what happens if the package is, is, is installed already? If the package is installed already, then this happens. It doesn't try to install it. It detects that it's installed already. In this case, it by default, it's going to omit reporting on something that didn't change. If we want to change that, we change the state for both option in the config file to true. OK. And yep. Package Nginx is already installed, changes nothing. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so say it will still behave the same if, it, if you install this manually, like it has to be installed. Exactly. And say what happens if somebody then removes your package afterwards? Then this happens. Or does it still install it? I don't need Yes. Right. I don't trust metadata for live systems. Well, I shouldn't say that it's quite that blanketly. I mean, you have to. But, <laughs> but I mean, as far as salt is concerned, when you're checking the stateful behavior of a system, there we go, we installed it again. When you're checking this, the stateful nature of a system, what you do inside of a state is you first say, this, this is going to happen, or we want this state to be there. Check to see if that state already exists. If it does, return what was in green. If it doesn't, then make that state exist and then return everything that you needed to do to make that state exist and, and then return all, everything that you did to make that state exist. Does that make sense? OK. Now, really quick. Um, this will be a silly ongoing demo that we're using the Apache module to install Nginx, but my, my general apologies out there to the world of Apache developers. Now, 
Any questions on that, on that basic structure of a top file? Okay. Now, the next thing that we can do in a top file is, is I, put a, I put a matcher in there, and that was obviously a glob matcher because those are the defaults. Um, if we want to match on something else, then we can. And so if I go back into the top file, then we can make another matcher. and to assign a new SLS file. So now this is going to say that we're only going to install swap this swappiness SLS um, if the OS is Fedora. And we can match multiple things inside of this file. So in this case, it's actually fairly common to have on the top of your environment a star like this that says these are a few things that we're going to install on everybody and then get more granular as you go down. Okay. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this high state data structure. Before, before I go into too much detail, I'm gonna, I'm gonna spin up one that's a little more complicated because we've been ridiculously terse. And, um, and discuss what's going on in one that's, again, a little more complicated. Let's see. No, no, no. Let's make Andrew Morton happy. Set the swappiness to 100. OK. So let's start talking a little bit about what's going on in here. And then I'll, and then I'll go back over into the specification file. Every single line in this has a name and is doing a specific thing. So at the top, we've got the ID declaration. That's the vm.swappiness. Now, that's going to pass into the state function the name that's being used, or, or that fulfills the name argument, which is mandatory when writing a state function. Next, we've got syscturl.present. This is the state declaration line. This is where we're declaring what state it is that we're going to actually be using. In this case, we're using the, the syscturl um, dot present state. We're verifying that something is going to be present in the syscturl system. And then below that, we've got any arguments that we're going to be passing into this system, into, well, into this function. In this case, we've got value is 100. Next. So yeah, so we've got ID declaration, state declaration, arguments. Now beyond that, if we go back to our Apache, our sorry, our, our Apache slash nginx situation here, we've made it a little different. So we've got the state declaration. Oh, sorry, the uh, Nginx, which is the ID declaration, package, which is the state declaration, and we've separated out the state and the function. And the function in this case is installed, and the function in this case is running. So we can have multiple state declarations sitting happily below one ID declaration. The benefit there is that we don't have to repeat saying that it's Nginx every time. But let's say that it's not Nginx every time. 
which actually appears to be the case. Oh. I can't remember how to do this in system D. <laughs> anyway. Let's say that it's not. Then we can override the ID in one of these sub guys here with what's called a, a name daemon. Okay? I know it's not NGINXD. Does anybody remember what it is in Fedora? No? Okay. Because as long as I'm in good company. What? That, that's true. <laughs> I might have Apache doing something. <laughs> OK. Anyway, we can add more arguments into these as well. The other thing that we can do is add a type of statement in called a requisite. So obviously, we don't want to try and see if the service should start running unless we verify that the package is installed. Okay. Now, this is how this is how we begin to order what's going on inside of an SLS file, or inside of the, the the SLS files as a whole. And so we can say require package nginx. And so now we're going to just verify rather quickly that nginx has been installed before we try and run the service. Similarly, let's say, no, 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 that's not enough. If the NGINX package is ever changed or upgraded, then I want to restart NGINX, or I want to reload NGINX. And so we can use a different requisite statement. The, these requisite statements, I mean, they've got their own little class of statement where there's currently um, three requisite statements and three what we call requisite in statements. So in this case, we're saying that make sure that this service doesn't do anything until we've required NGINX, or this, until we've verified that NGINX has been installed. The next requisite statement is called watch. This requires, does exactly the same thing as require, but it also, um, will reload or restart. If, if we say reload true, then it'll reload. Um, but it'll restart Nginx if we ever get a return from the package installed that has stuff in that changes dictionary. Now, one of, one of our major differentiating factors from some of the other configuration management systems out there is how we run. It's um, it's common in a, a different dominant configuration management system. What they do is that they start an event loop. And so if an event occurs, then they notify another aspect of, um, of their configuration management run that this needs to occur. I've noticed that that event loop has occasionally done things like restart Apache seven times in a run, which fills me with fear. Um, so there's no event loop in here. I've also noticed that building an event loop like that can generally use up a lot more RAM and resources and is a little slower. And we want SALT to always be high performant, not just because we want it to be fast and you always want software to be fast, but much more so because we want it to have the lowest possible, possible impact on target systems. Um, yeah, we don't, we don't want to get too much of that, that Heisenberg effect going on. So how this works is that we take this data structure and we compile it into this finite list of things to do in order. So when we say require or watch, it's going to make sure that no matter what, everything that is required by service, service.running for NGINX, is going to happen before we even start looking at this guy so that we have a full data set of what to work with. Okay. Now, 
Similarly, so we've got a watch statement in here, and I mentioned that there's these other things called requisite in statements. Similarly, we can say, well, maybe I don't want to define, and maybe I don't want to keep this big list of everything that we're requiring or watching inside of the service stanza here. Maybe I want to do it every time I declare a package or a file. I want to say, I've declared this package or this file, and just so you know, this stanza shouldn't, should always run before this other one, and this other one's going to require it. So we can do this. Okay, so this is the exact same thing we just did, just backwards. So now we're saying that make sure that we're watching service, that we're watching package.install for nginx inside of service nginx. Make sense? This makes it very easy to be able to say that let's say that, let's say that we've got, got it the way it was before, like this. And then we're extending this SLS file somewhere else and adding a config file that we want to be watched by um, the Nginx service. We can declare watch in in this other file and it'll map back. This is, this is kind of similar to a puppet notify, kind of. All right. So. We've got requisites. We've got the basic ideas going on in here. Okay. Now I'm going to I'm going to walk over to this guy. And our documentation. I put the link into uh Oh, no, this is the right document for some reason. My Anyway, sorry. All right. This data structure has a spec file. It's, well, it's got a specification that, def that defines exactly what every little piece of the SLS data does. The benefit here is that you can always come back and reference this to say, oh, well, what does this hierarchy really look like? in case you're scratching your head and going, I'm getting an error and I don't know what that means. Because um, that happens to the best of us, right? <laughs> and I mean that as in me giving you an error that isn't intuitive enough. I'm, I'm working on it. Always, always willing, always happy to have feedback on ways to make errors a little more intuitive. Okay. But if we go down here to the bottom, we've got a large example of all of the different things that we can that we can shove in here. So we've got include declarations that allows us to have references to other SLS modules. Extend declarations, that allows us to basically extend or overwrite the behavior of any other module that we've included. And then we've got our basic hierarchy right here that we've already talked about. ID declaration, state declaration, the optional function can be here or here if we use that dot delimitation all of the keyword arguments. We can overwrite the name if we want, otherwise the ID declaration is the name. And then do a requisite declaration and a list of all of the things that something's going to require. And then, to quickly mention, there's one more aspect here called names. Names allows us to take all of the functions and all of the arguments for an ID and a state and then replicate it with lots of different names. So we can do something like this. That was anticlimactic when I hit the wrong button, isn't it? Now, so let's see. Obviously, we're not going to have a package named Python Packages. But now I can say names. 
and come in and say Python make o um, Xenos um, Python Jinja2 Okay. So this names statement, and then we basically covered everything you can do in these files, and that does cover every piece of functionality you need in config management to make this happen outside of when we talk about Jinja templating. Um, but so now we're going to run pkg.installed for all of these individual packages and it separates them all out into their own atomic states for you so that you can make something again much more terse. I'm actually not going to save this because I've used package names that don't particularly work. Okay. So Despite the fact that hopefully when I'm going over when I'm when I'm going over this YAML, um, it the the hope is that it just kind of makes sense. Um, but we've got all of these individual little components, and the more you work with Salt and become become a little more aware of what these individual components are and what they look like, then it's going to make more sense to be able to go back to that spec. But frankly, to get going, most people don't need to so to get the goal is that to get going with salt is very easy but as time goes on you will continue to learn more about the depths and breadth of the system okay I'm almost out of time for this for this chunk and so I'll probably pick up on uh, pick up on this in the next hour so I'll just get a few more in state documentation that's that's great. That's not a link. So we've got documentation on how to lay out SLS data. Um, we've got, there's a tutorial in here. Here we go. A full list of built-in states. So we took a we took a brief look at service.running, we took a brief look at package.installed, we took a brief look at syscatorial.present. Uh, We've got quite a few states that are available to use inside of Salt right now. And they're all documented right up here on uh, on the documentation and generally have examples. So we can see that if we want to add an alias to the aliases file for a mail server, then we can define it in salt and say username alias is present and what the target is. And we can just go, we, we could, I'm not going to. Um, I'll, I'll mention a few of these of note. Uh, file, for instance, is generally going to be one of your, one of your most uh, widely used statements and one that has more arguments. So in this case, we're going to be laying down an http.conf file. We're going to be using the managed function inside of the file module. The source is back on the salt server in the Apache directory, and it's named http.conf. So these config files are in line with all of the SLS files. And we're able to declare any the, the general things that you would be declaring with a file, um, user, group, mode, Etc. Then we can say that this file isn't a flat file that we're just downloading and putting into place, but this file needs to be rendered as a Jinja template. Right now we support three types of templating engines in, in um, file managed. One is Jinja, the second is Mako. Um, you do have to have Mako installed on the minions to be able to use it. The third is a pure Python renderer, or sorry, a pure Python template. So it'll just execute a function in a Python file, and then whatever the string is that that function returns will be written directly to the file. 
So we've got a couple of ways that we can use templates inside of files. Okay. And then as we go down, these state modules are going to come with a lot of individual functions. Some, well, some, many more than others. File probably has more than any at this point, I think. Um, they can do different things. So we can come in here and say that we've, we want to make a directory. It's going to be owned by Fred. And we're going to make sure that directory is there. By make durs, we're making sure that if stuff isn't there, then we'll make the stuff directory and sub stuff instead of erroring out and saying, I can't make a directory there. It's a subdirectory of a non existent directory. Okay. Seth, I thought we fixed this. Oh, look at all the underscore. Oh, he's not even here. <laughs> all the underscore ones. He knew I was going to rag on him because of this. Okay. If, if there's a function inside of, uh, inside of a module, whether it be a module or a state module or whatever, that's got an underscore in front of it, it gets ignored um, by the external access system. So it shouldn't be showing up in the documentation. So there's a bug in our docs. OK. But so we come down here, and we're able to see that we've got quite a, quite a few functions. We've got file.absent, make sure that a file isn't there. File.append, make sure that a certain chunk of text is just magically at the end of a file. Commenting a fi commenting lines in a file directory. Make sure a file's managed. That's going to be one of your most common ones. Um, file dot recurse is kind of kind of nifty. You're able to set up a um, a directory hierarchy on the master, and then recursively copy all of those files into a directory on the minion, and verify any changes. So you can, have a, you can have a directory of files and then occasionally change one or two and then recursively copy all of those files down. And if it detects that one file has changed, then it'll just bring that ind in individual change in. So how performant is that? Like is, can you do like cold source trees or just like for a couple files, like a big directory? Um, um, I wouldn't use it for a full source tree if you have a lot of minions. It's very performant if it's not fanning out. Um, so, so that does work. Um, it, is, it is capable of dealing with very large uh, trees. I generally test it with the kernel source. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do, if, if you're rolling out source updates then you're pro to, to larger environments then you'd probably want to come up with something something else like using a package management system or rsync or what is it yahoo that's using BitTorrent. there's a lot of creative ways to solve that particular problem um, that's definitely not a one size fits all for that problem <laughs> it can get complicated okay simlink we're setting up a simlink touch make sure it files there so okay So lots of stuff in there. Now, pillar. I don't. We we might not have enough time to go into depth on what pillar is today, but pillar allows you to create a structure of data on the master in a different tree. It works very similar to the state tree, but lets you assign arbitrary data back to individual minions. Um, so that that data is always minion specific. Um, it allows you to do some really tricky and higher level things. Um, you don't need to use it, but it's available. Some, some guys in the community swear by it. They actually write all of their SLS data raw inside of their pillars and then just realize them in SLS files. Um, but Personally, I only use Pillar for the occasional little chunks of data. But yeah, if we have time, then we'll cover, we'll cover Pillar in more detail a little later on. All right. Now, let's say that we want to put some logic inside of our SLS files. 
Let's say that our SLS files um, need to repeat the same thing over and over again with minor modification, aka uh, a loop. <laughs> Let's say that our SLS files need to apply different names for different packages based on different operating systems. Um, or let's say that we want to define a function, function-like behavior inside of our SLS files. We can use the Jinja templating engine on top of it. Now that's the default that it comes with. Like I was saying earlier, um, SLS files, they're just data structures. I don't, Salt doesn't care how it gets the data structure. All it cares about is that it gets the data structure. And so we don't need to represent it the way we've been doing here with YAML. We can represent it in JSON. We can represent it in pure Python. As long as that data structure is represented, we can represent it in YAML and then run it through Cheetah. We can represent it in YAML and run it through Mako. We can do whatever you want, whatever floats your boat. Um, the default is Jinja because Jinja is a very widely used and very performant um, templating language. It's also very similar to, to Django. Uh, Django templates and things of that nature. So we felt as though it would, it would be good for general adoption. Now, using Jinja inside of your, inside of your states, actually instead of drawing all of these out, I'm going to cheat and show you some that already exist. There we go, that's a good one. All right. So, let's say that we're installing Vim. And we've got a couple of different operating systems that we need to deal with. So we can pull out the ginger right here and say, you know, it's named Vim by default, but if, it's, but if we've got a Red Hat system, then the name's gonna be Vim Enhanced. And, and or if statement. And so inside of Jinja, inside of these Jinja templates, you have access to grain, all of the grains for that particular system. You also have access to directly execute any modules. Please just do that to gather data. Don't like do things in the Jinja templating. That kind of breaks the model. But at the end of the day, it's not my system, it's yours, do what you want. But so all of this information is available. Also, all of the information from Pillar is available inside of the Jinja template as well. But so we can create loops and things of this nature. Now, uh, we were really excited about using Jinja. One of the, one of the first deployments that I had Salt on, um, we were migrating away from a different configuration management system. And thanks to some of the flexibility that we had inside of Jinja and the fact that we could very easily call modules or directly shell out without building in extra components and we can directly access a this, uh, the module API from these files, we're able to do some things like take, uh, we took our solar install at that particular company and it was using, uh, with the old configuration management system, um, there were 12 configuration files in there, um, three files declaring um, code for the, old, for the other configuration management system, and, um, and there were about 700 lines of code for the other configuration management system. When we converted to SALT, because we could use some basic loops and we were able to inject a little more information, the result was that instead of it being 15 files, it was now three. It was all done in about 60, 60, 65 lines of SALT SLS. And instead of having 12 config files, we only had three config files because they were all basically identical and we were able to inject more data into them. But anyway, you can do things that are ridiculously powerful by moving over and injecting some, some raw code. Now, 
the main idea here, again, going back to when, when, I, when I made the joke about a beard and writing a programming language, is that, is that we have at our disposal many interfaces to inject pure code into, into our processes. So we might as well use what's already there. Other guys have done a fantastic job of building these sorts of, uh, these sorts of things for us. And so we're able to piggyback on other people's work. And we're also able to then, since it's pluggable, integrate with anybody's existing systems. Which is why we've got companies that have come back and said to us, hey, you know, we like Jinja and all, but we're a Mako shop. And they're just going to run Mako on everything instead of Jinja. And they can do that. You can run, you can run it any way you'd like. I've never had someone not use YAML, though. Everybody likes to use YAML. Occasionally, they'll inject a pure Python one. OK. Running states. I did one example, state.highState. Let's go back over here. High state says, go out. Look at the, I must have sent a bad argument into that swappiness call, didn't I? That looks beautiful. Now, we say state.high state, which says, go out, get that top file, follow orders, do what the top file says. We can in turn say, you know, I don't want to actually run anything, but I want to see what the high state actually looks like. And so we can see the compiled high state. Fantastic. Let's say that we want to see what the, what we call the low state looks like. The low state is going to be the ordered list in which things are going to be running. And so we see that by default, and this is before evaluating those requisite statements, it's going to first try this guy, then this guy, then this guy. But so that allows us to get very close in and say, this is, this is all those SLS files that I made. This is what they really look like um, when we tear them apart. Next, let's say that we don't want to deal with the top file. I just want to directly grab a module and run it. So we can say, just give me a single SLS. Or we could do a, a list, a common to limited list of SLSs, so that we can set this up in such a way that you never would need to even make a top file. You just make a bunch of SLS files and then call them directly. And yeah, that was something that Spotify came and asked us for. OK, Let's see if I'm missing any here. Good, did, oh, yes, single. Let's say I want to bypass this malarkey of doing anything at all with SLS files, and I just want to manually run a state call. This is a great way to test to see if a state call that you've written is garbage or not. <laughs> see if it's actually running. So we can do state.single. That one. Um, my brain is saying Emacs, but we just don't have that bandwidth, do we? Screen. Screen, thank you. Screen, right, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 my bad. It's installed. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, we're able to just execute a single one-off state chunk, OK? And then wait forever to download Tmux. Fantastic. OK. All right, 
Any questions, comments, arguments, rebuttals? Yes. Yeah, yeah, this is the end of this. The, the problem, of course, being is that we've got lunch, what, at 12? Oh, 12.30? More or less. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're done with this. We're done with this presentation. And then we'll take, we'll take a 10-minute break and then probably come back and hit up the next one. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up, uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then, as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast; uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack, as a project, is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust 
platforms out there. Add on seeing your limits with the clouds tag. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Astris. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Astris, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astros based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astros or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astros. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.